<laughs> we were way back to get there. So anyway, um, so the Black Panther Party was charged with having a lot of guns, and we were considered this sort of opposite number of the Ku Klux Klan. People would say, oh, the Black Panthers, we don't want to be them. They're violent. They have all these guns. And I used to say, well, we did have a lot of guns for black people organized in the United States. And, um, and, uh, but I don't think we could have held our own against the uh, LAPD, where I joined the Black Panther Party in Los Angeles. I don't think we could have held. And if the LAPD called out some of their neighbors and the various other PDs, the sheriff's departments, the state, state police, the National Guard, the, uh, the United States Army, Marine Corps, um, the Air Force, the Coast Guard, the FBI, the CIA, the ATF, I don't think we had any real guns. This is an armed country, the United States is, in the world more guns are being distributed in the U.S. than probably anywhere and by the U.S. So but the biggest difference between the status of blacks in Canada, for example, and in the United States goes to the question of the institution of slavery in the United States, which created the wealth on which the United States became the most powerful nation in the world. Today, in the age of Obama, <laughs> Um, somebody asked me later. I don't like uh, spending too much time right now on that issue. Um, but in the, here in the age of Obama, black people in America represent 25% of the poor. We have the highest unemployment rate right like here, but among young black men, that rate is running 50-60%. Black-owned business revenues represent less than 1% of all business revenues, meaning we own nothing in America. We have the highest rates of homelessness, the lowest education levels. Infant mortality rate remains the same for the last 40 some years, which is double that of white babies. We have a mort maternal mortality rate that is four times that of whites. We actually have a maternal mortality rate in the U.S. Breast cancer death rate is double that of white women. Black men die of prostate cancer in the United States at the highest rate of prostate cancer death in the world. And black people represent 50% of the prison population in the United States. Now some people want to say to me, well, you know, it's really like 47.2%. So, uh, okay, it's 47%. It's 50% of the prison population blacks represent, and we're only 13%. So the question arises, and this is the part I like to get to and have us think about today, this evening, is why? Why is that true? Something wrong with black people? You know how people say, well, you know, in America, at least in the United States, that is, that people will say, well, you know, the, the, the uh, Koreans came here, and they did all right. And uh, the other people come from other countries, they do all right. And so what is wrong with black people in America? And one of the, uh, and I make note that at the same time we look at the picture of black people in America, just making note that on the, con the continent of Africa, the poorest countries uh, in the world are on the continent of Africa. So we'd have to say maybe there really is something uh, wrong with black people uh, in the world. And, and there are people who ask that question, as a matter of fact, answer that there is something wrong. Matter of fact, there have been actual, uh, thank you, actual uh, studies done. People actually have tried to have a scientific study called themselves scientists, uh, saying that they want to study if there is some genetic, genetic connection between uh, black people, let's say, and crime, as though crime were not a political question and not a biological question. You know, uh, you can... Like well, okay. well, yeah. <laughs> the idea was to bring it to, 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 to my mouth. So, <laughs> but, uh, I've adopted two children. Alex and they, uh, can, is that better or worse? I don't know. That's good. About the same. Whatever. All right. So, you know, and, and I speak about Africa but when we think about all the resources and riches world wants that are on the continent of Africa and yet the continent remains, the people remain poor. Now, back in 1993 when Bill Clinton had just become president, and you know, some people thought, thank you so much, some people thought of Bill Clinton as the first black president. You know, people, people in the United States were like, oh, he's black. I don't know why people like Tony Morrison even said Bill Clinton was the first black president of the United States. I was not one of those people. But nevertheless, there was a lot of black people that loved Clinton, love him today think he was the most wonderful president since Lyndon Johnson, whom they also loved. Uh, but uh, Bill Clinton did many things, but one of the things he did in the beginning of his first term was to introduce America to the real neoliberal agenda by which, under which we live today. And that is that in a speech that he gave in 1993 in Memphis, Tennessee, where Dr. King had gave his last great speech, you know, the one where he said, 
Uh, I'm not fearing any man tonight. I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen the other side. So if I don't get there, I know we as a people will get that speech. There in Memphis, Tennessee, and there is Clinton standing in 1993 talking to a black uh, audience of, uh, of church people in that church and saying, uh, if Martin Luther King were alive today, I wonder what, standing by my side, what would he say? This is Clinton purporting to know what Martin Luther King, King would say. And he says, I believe he would say that I died for your freedom, but look what you've done, I said. And all the black people went, oh, you're right. What have we done? Oh, we messed up freedom. You know? He said, I died for your freedom, but look what you've done. I said, all this black on black crime, all this uh, unwed black mothers and all this breakdown of the black family and everybody hung their head in shame opening the door for Clinton to get support for the three strikes crime bill so we could correct ourselves on all this black on black crime and opening the door for the welfare reform bill that passed in 1996 so we could condemn four women for having babies out of wedlock and make sure that those babies were not going to be supported. And the thing about that that's important is that what Clinton said was that look, you have your citizenship, 64, Civil Rights Act, 65, Voting Rights Act. There is nothing stopping you from moving ahead in America except that you must be lazy or you committing too many crimes, running around you killing each other. That's the problem. There's nothing wrong with America anymore. We've corrected us. There's something wrong with you. Something wrong with you. And that is the agenda, the neoliberal agenda to say government isn't responsible for you anymore. If you can't get food or housing or medical care or those things you need to, to, uh, to, die, to, to live, if you can't get these things, there's something wrong with you. We can't keep bailing you out, unless you're a you know, big bank or something like that. Uh, so the Three Strikes Crime Bill passed in 1994. Within 10 years, the prison population of America, the United States of America, doubled. And we know that the United States has the highest prison population in the world, both percentage-wise and by numbers, and we know that black people represent 50% of that. And we also know that the uh, welfare reform bill not only criminalized uh, poor women, and black women were the focus of it, but poor women in general, but it also eliminated any safety net that might have existed for poor children. So as a result, we have more children hungry in the United States and, and all of these other things. So either we believe that something must be wrong with black people because everything is okay otherwise, or we believe that something must be wrong with the scheme of things in the United States. You know, I lived in France, as was mentioned, um, and when I was there in 1994, there was a guy named Paul Tuvier who was put on trial uh, by the French government, the first uh, Vichy uh, government uh, official who was ever tried for collaboration with the Nazi government. And uh, the French, who are really ambivalent about their relationship uh, with Jews, I would say the France is pretty much anti-Semitic in general. But um, the French were very upset about having this trial because uh, Tuvier was an old man and this was resurrecting old wounds. And so there were a number of editorials and outcries about, you know, look, this man is old, the war is over, can't we move on, can't we just turn the page of history? And you know, in America and the United States, and probably here, people want to turn the page. They don't want to talk about the quantum and they don't want to talk about the real history of Canada and what happened here, who got crushed, and whose land we're living on, and all the blood that runs freely through this land that we walk around on every day. We don't want to talk about this thing because we want to just move on. You know, how we say that we just want to move on. And so the French prosecutor said something I like to quote because I'm going to go down this road. Uh, and he said, you know, you're correct, we have to turn the page of history, but in order to turn that page, we have to write that page. That is to say, we have to acknowledge the crime took place, and we have to correct that before we can move on. So let's just talk about, if we want to say, if there's, no, if there's something wrong with black people, if not, then let's talk about how we got to where we are at this continuing entrenched, oppressed status in the United States of America. And so we know that black things out arrive in the United States looking for a better life or religious freedom. You know, uh, Malcolm X used to say, uh, we didn't land on Plymouth, Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock landed on us. You know, that used to be the kind of catchphrase of the day. But the bottom line was when uh, blacks came to the United States, specifically to Jamestown, the English colony of Jamestown, in the 1600s, we did not come looking for religious freedom. We came as slaves. But of course, this was after uh, the English had... Uh, completely wiped out the po all 30 tribes of the Powhatan Confederacy 
Pocahontas' daddy and everybody in the Powhatan Confederacy, and then they settled it and called it Jamestown after King James, after which the Bible was then named also. By 1776, the United States uh, had developed its agricultural base in such a way that South Carolina rice planters and Georgia cotton growers were among the richest men in the world, and the country was founded as a country, uh, it started out as a company, of course, the London Company, uh, just as this started out as what the, the Northwest Company. Hudson Bay. That was after Northwest. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Check it out. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so in any case, but Hudson Bay, yeah. same thing, started out as a yeah, company. Yeah. Still is a company, uh, but that's another conversation, but you're right. So they started out as a London company, but now they're going to be a country and resist and, and uh, have rebellion against the English and so forth, and formed a country which was a slave-holding nation. There wasn't a single uh, member of the 13 original nations that was opposed to slavery. So I always am amazed that people want someone to look at the flag of the United States of America and not, and not realize that was the flag of a state slave-holding nation. Every single uh, country and every every single state and every single president and every single signer, with maybe one exception, and I hate when people tell me about the exception, uh, was a slaveholder, especially Thomas Jefferson, the author, so-called author of the Declaration of Independence, who who had to figure out a way because he was a Francophile to explain to the French exactly how you could say that you could have a a country founded on the concept of the equality of all men and still be a slaveholding nation. And in 1781, he published his book for the French called Notes on the State of Virginia, in which he explains how you can do that. And in Notes on the State of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson points out that there's a difference between the black and the white that is important. Uh, for example, he says, uh, their skin, that immovable veil of, of black, is not beautiful, like the admixture of white and, and red among whites. Their hair is not long and flowing like our hair. Their skin has a terrible odor. They lust after their women. They do not have any art or literature in them. They are lazy, and they, are, uh, they have no, no other talents or skills that I can detect. And Thomas Jefferson says, I advance it, therefore, that the black is inferior to the white in the endowments of both body and mind. Therefore, we can't be talking about the equality of all men if we're talking about the black, because the black really doesn't qualify as a human being. This is from Thomas Jefferson, whom William Jefferson Clinton uh, idolized, and the entire United States government, the uh, uh, United States still idolizes. And that is important because it allows for the convergence of class and race, because you have a slave class, a laboring class working for free, and that laboring class is composed of nothing but African people and their descendants, and whatever other mixtures came along after that, they were all based on, on race, so-called race. By the time the country started to evolve by 1815, the cotton exports from the United States were fueling an entire industrial revolution. Matter of fact, Karl Marx said, without slavery, there'd be no cotton. Without cotton, there would be no modern industry. And by 1860, the U.S. was second only to Great Britain and France in all manufacturing. Now, why is this important? Because by this same time, there was a foundation of a new party because we had the steam engine coming into play, and there was a, a new and rising class introducing industrialization. And, and one of the spokespeople for that class was Abraham Lincoln, who was an attorney for the railroads. And matter of fact, by the time he was elected by this new Republican Party in his 1861 inaugural speech, he says, I have no purpose to interfere with the institution of slavery where it exists, because Lincoln asserts that he did believe in white superiority. He's, but he was a... Uh, a supporter of the expansion of the country uh, to the West using the railroad lines, and he urged that there be free labor. Therefore, if slaves were engaged in labor, then white men could not be paid to expand the country. And that was his big argument with the South. And the South said, well, just a minute, just a minute. Now, let us talk about we're not going to have all this because we're making more money off of slavery than anyone. And so the South. Southern states began to secede, and I'll just read a piece of what Mississippi state legislature, what the Mississippi state legislature said in its declaration of secession. It said, "Quote: Our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Its labor supplies the product which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of commerce on earth. These products have become necessities of the world, and a blow at slavery is a blow at commerce and civilization." Pretty heavy 
well as slavery is a blow at civilization. So by 1863, when the war was waging, being waged, the Confederate, the War of the States, as they like to say, or the, uh, the uh, Civil War, the Confederates, you see, the Confederate States were winning the war. Everybody should know that. And that's important because Lincoln then had a problem. He thought that they could easily defeat the South, these 11 states, but they didn't. And so he said, I'm going to have to do something, as he called it, a necessary war measure. I'm going to issue a, an emancipation proclamation freeing the slaves in the seceding states. Of course, this was a little ridiculous since he wasn't the president of the seceding states. They had a president. And, uh, but in any case, the blacks heard about it and began to drop their... They're all of their, uh, all of their, uh, their uh, hoes and guard, whatever they were using to uh, pick cotton and so forth and so on, and left their plantations, undermining the labor force that backed up the Confederacy and the tide of war changed. Thousands of black slaves started following uh, General Sherman as he burned Atlanta and marched to Savannah to the sea, and the Civil War ended. Thousands and thousands of blacks, a million, four millions of blacks were, were slaves, but they were now no longer slaves. It was just part of what had just occurred. And so Sherman, General Sherman, who was not an abolitionist by any stretch of imagination, issues field order number 15, said, we got to do something with these people, so we're going to give them 40 acres of land to start their lives over in this new uh, union called the United States of America. But of course, by the time some of those slaves started settling on those lands. The new president said, you better get off this land. We're going to reconstruct this whole country, and it doesn't include you and your 40 acres. you got black people in America right now in the United States looking for 40 acres and a mule today. And we just didn't get those 40 acres. That happened in about a one-year period, and then it was over. And there was a period that we, we call the re-enslavement of blacks. And there's a wonderful book called Slavery by another, by another name, by Douglas Blackman. It talks about the specifics of how blacks were then re-enslaved, not only by the black codes, which were the laws that governed black behavior in the former Confederate states, but also uh, by uh, the practices of just outright racism uh, and so forth. So by the time the 13th Amendment was ratified, the black codes had dictated what black people could and could not do. And one thing you couldn't do if you were black was not have a job. I don't know how you could have gone from being a slave to having a job, but it was a crime to not have a job, and you, which was punishable by work, hard work for free, building up railroads, coal mining, and so forth and so on. Why is this important? It's important because the status of black people never really changed from 1865 forward, even though we had the uh, 13th Amendment, which uh, outlawed or prohibited slavery. So by the time we get to 1896, the end of that century, we have the case of Homer Plessy. Some of you may have heard of the case of Plessy v. Ferguson. This is an important case because Homer Plessy was what was called an octoroon. An octoroon was somebody who had only one ace black blood, although we never know what black blood looks like. But it means that a black person and a white person had a child. That child uh, had a child with another white, that one with another, and so forth, until the point where he only had so-called one eighth black. And so he was so white that he decided, along with some of his friends, to test the segregationist principles on public transportation. He boarded a train in New Orleans to sit and sat in the white car, where everybody paid the same price that paid to sit in the black car, but they sat back there with the various animals and the, and the, um, and the uh, luggage and so forth. And Homer Plessy demanded that he sit in the white car. First, his first argument was that he was more white than black, so he should be deemed black. And the Supreme Court, when the case got there, said, Homer, you're black, so go on back to the black to the black car. We are deeming you black. And he said, well, all right, my real argument is then that I paid the same price. I should have the same accommodations. I should have equal accommodations with the blacks. And so the court says, well, we can't make you, uh, we can't make these white people accept sitting next to you on the, in these cars. But we can say that as long as the accommodations are equal, they can be separate. And this gave us the law of separate but equal, or the segregationist policies of what came to be known as Jim Crow laws in the United States. And why is this important? Because black people didn't have a train, so it didn't matter if you had an equal train, because nobody was building a train for you. So you had to figure out how you were going to get on the good train. Or you had to figure out how you were going to get health care, because you didn't really have any hospitals. Or you had to figure out how you were going to get a house, because you didn't have any equal housing. Or you had to figure out how you were going to go to school, because there was no equal schooling. So the absurdity of the Plessy case became the thing that black people fought for the next 60, 70 years 
just to figure out how to survive. And you had Booker T. Washington talking about, you know, I'm not going to ask to integrate with anybody white in America, but I am going to say that we've got to get some money. We will stay right here and build our own, our own uh, institutions like Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama. And following up on that was Marcus Garvey. I just had a wonderful conversation with Dr. Kista Adade about uh, Nkrumah, Kwame Nkrumah's uh, an admiration for uh, Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey, of course, coming from Jamaica, came following in Booker T. Washington's footsteps, wanting to meet him. They never met, but trying to build an independent black economy, knowing that there were no equal things for black people that were being provided. And the same thing was true uh, with the Nation of Islam as founded by uh, Elijah Muhammad. So right at the turn of the century, uh, we find all of these efforts being made to either have an independent economy or you had the NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, arguing that we had to find ways to uh, desegregate America, fighting against lynching, fighting for jobs, and so forth. And so people did everything to survive, and when World War I arises, you had Henry Ford up in Detroit saying, look, if, if I'll take any black worker that wants to come up here and work on this new thing called the assembly line. And so you had the first great migration of blacks north out of the south and out of the segregated south into the north where they could find work because people walked literally in many cases just to get a job. You know, it's always amazing to me when people say that black people are not willing to work. They must have forgotten about the first great migration and how hard it was for, and what people did just to get work. And then, of course, there was a second great migration to try to find work during the Second World War when Henry Kaiser in Oakland called blacks from Louisiana and Texas and elsewhere to come and work on the docks of, of Oakland and, and his to build the ships for, the, for World War II. And then after World War II, everybody just knew because we had participated in the war. We had fought against the Germans. Uh, there had been the Tuskegee Airmen who had come home as, her as heroes of the war. We just knew that Jim Crow would finally be broken down and we'd be able to get a house and get a job and, <clears throat> excuse me, get the things that we need to survive. This is my water or anybody's water? Whose water is it? Anyway, where did it come from? You know I'm going to ask that question. So anyway, I have a tendency. Okay, so Alex, get me a drink first. Right now. <laughs> so, excuse me. So as we move forward, we found that there were no, there seemed to be no way to get anything, and so, and so we finally said, well, maybe we can find a pathway to freedom uh, through education, and you, and you have black people organizing to desegregate the schools, and ultimately culminating in the 1954 decision in Brown versus uh, Board of Education out of Topeka, Kansas. Little Linda Brown's father saying, look, my daughter should be able to go to a decent school, and, and the school that white people have is decent, and the court said, you're right. Separate is not equal as to public education. We're going to desegregate these schools. Never <clears throat> has there been so much bloodshed over the idea of white children having to sit next to black children in public schools. So when we talk about black people not wanting to be educated, you forgot about the struggle and the blood that was shed to enforce the Brown decision, which has yet to be enforced, even as we speak. And then by 1955, we have that great moment with Rosa Parks doing what Plessy did in 18 in the 1800s, trying to get a seat on a bus. Don't own a bus, don't have any acres, have nothing. But I got to go to work cleaning floors for white, rich people, but in the meantime, I have no way to get there. I can't even sit on the bus, even though I pay the same price in that great moment in the Montgomery bus boycott. For one year, black people in Montgomery, Alabama would not take the bus. And of course, from that, we get the powerful voice of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., forming the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and leading that bus boycott and, um, and doing, finally desegregating the bus line, but we never owned the bus line, but we could now get a seat on the bus line. And out of that gave, gave Rose this incredible freedom movement. We never called it the civil rights movement. We called it the freedom movement. Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. And so you had SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and CORE. And you had the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party with Fannie Lou Hamer, the great leader of Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, talking about I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Everyone was fighting for something because everyone realized there was this moment in time which culminated uh, in the 1963 March on Washington. And we all think of Dr. King in that moment. And we also think he died then. <laughs> it was like 
we forgot he lived. We forgot he lived like five more years later. He's talking about a dream, wasn't sure what that dream was. We, something about some little children walking up a mountain, holding hands, singing something, whatever it was. We don't know what the dream was, but we know there were 250,000 people marched on Washington, and the tide changed in 1964. Civil rights legislation was passed, and within the next year, the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965. So from 1865 to 1965, 100 years it took for black people to have the right to use the same public toilets as white people and for black people to be able to drink out of a public fountain where white people uh, drank out of it. And that's just about all that happened because nothing else uh, was changed as to the status of black people. And so in 1966 when the Black Panther Party was formed, we advocated for black liberation, though we said that it would require a revolution in the United States of America, meaning a complete and fundamental change. By two years from then, the United States government had not only declared Martin Luther King a, an enemy, had targeted him as part of a black nationalist hate group, but they had deemed the Black Panther Party uh, the greatest threat to the internal security of the United States. And as I said, our goal was black liberation, but we recognized that that was our goal. But in order to achieve our goal, we had to recognize what we had to do. The first thing we deemed, though, is that we were not free. We were oppressed in America in 1966, and we wanted to end that oppression towards self-determination. Our first point of our 10-point platform and program was we want freedom. We want the power to determine the destiny of our black communities. And we said that our goal was subjective because it was in our interest for black people to be free. But we were not black nationalists, and so we knew that we could not create a nation within a nation, and we didn't have that intention, although there were others who did. So we said that what were, what were the strategies and what were the things that we had to do in order to be free? Ideologically, we were Marxist-Leninists. People don't realize they think we're some kind of uh, nationalists who hated white people. Um, uh, we always said philosophically that we identify with the words of Che Guevara, uh, a true revolutionary is guided by great feelings of love, not by hate. But in any case, we recognized that the system of capitalism on which we had been enslaved, which gave rise to our slavery, was certainly not a system that we had to embrace. How would we become free under the very system that had oppressed us? And so we were certainly not capitalists. We were communists with a small c. But we also recognized that we could not talk, call ourselves free if others were oppressed. And we were one of the only black organizations and even progressive organizations of the time who recognized not only our, uh, our strategic interest, but our moral imperative was to align ourselves with other oppressed people. And so we helped to form and formed a coalition with the American Indian Movement, AIM. And we helped to form and formed a coalition with the Brown Berets, Chicanos coming out of California, who were uh, as oppressed as any black uh, people had ever been. And we re recognized and helped to form a coalition with the Young Lords, uh, Puerto Ricans out of Chicago and New York, and with the Red Guard, Chinese out of, out of San Francisco, and with the Young Patriots, poor whites out of Chicago. We also had uh, international coalitions, working coalitions with the PAC in South Africa, and with ZANU in Zimbabwe, and with Perlimo in Mozambique, and we recognized and supported the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the PFLP, and we had relations with Cuba, with Central, in Central and South American liberation organizations, and in China and Vietnam, and in specifically during that period when everyone was on one side or the other of the war, we called for victory for the Viet Cong. You could imagine how hard that was. The government was just about finished with us by that time. We, we not only called for an end to the war, we called for victory for the Viet Cong. And we said, how can we talk about the freedom of black people in America when gays are oppressed? And so we said that gay liberation was a part of our struggle. And we said that women's liberation was a part of our struggle. And we said that they said the rights of the disabled for independence was a part of our struggle. And we said that the rights of seniors and older people were part of our struggle, helping to form the Great Panthers and coalescing for the disabled with the Center for Independent Living and so forth. And we said, how can we talk about our liberation in the, in, in, the, uh, in the environment in which we live? And so we supported a greening, the greening of America and, and environmental rights. We organized around this 10-point platform and program, as I said, first point being freedom. We talked about full employment, an end to capitalist exploitation, decent housing, exemption from the military for wars that we had nothing to do with, police, an end to police brutality, um, noting that we uh, called on the right of all black people to be armed for self-defense. 
We called for the freedom of all black people in prison as they had not been given fair trials and so forth and so on. In the end, we called for land, bread, housing, justice, clothing, and peace. We organized around a number of survival programs, as we called them, under the slogan, Survival Pending Revolution. Many of you have heard of the Free Breakfast for Children program that we started, which all the children in the United States now have free breakfast, even though it might not have been as good as the one we served. But that program was picked up by the government, just like we called for free health care for everyone and created free health clinics. We did a number of other programs under this same idea, low-cost housing, free busing to prison, legal programs. And we worked through electoral campaigns. Bobby Steele and I ran for office a couple of times, as was mentioned. And we used our newspaper also to organize people, which was published for 13 years without stop. As I said, by 1968, the, the FBI called us the greatest threat to the eternal, internal security of the United States. And we fought, and we, we had raids, and we went through all that we went through, and we had internal conflicts. But by 1981, the Black Panther Party collapsed, and, in this, and the movement essentially was dead in the United States. And uh, we had the introduction of crack cocaine uh, through what... Uh, Gary Webb, the journalist uh, who was strangely died with two gunshot wounds to the head of the allegedly self-inflicted in a book that he wrote called Dark Alliance. So I want to close out by asking us to think about this question because Dr. King in 1967 made for me one of his greatest speeches entitled Where Do We Go From Here? And he was in the process of organizing the Poor People's Campaign. And he says, and I'm quoting, the movement must address itself to the question of restructuring the whole of American society. There are 40 million poor people and we must ask the question, why? And when you ask that question, you begin to question the capitalist economy. We've got to begin to ask questions about the whole society. Now when I say questioning the whole society, it means ultimately coming to see that the problem of racism, the problem of economic exploitation, and the problem of war are all tied together. He goes on to say, we are dealing with issues that cannot be solved without the nation undergoing a radical redistribution of economic power. That's not the Dr. King they like you to think about, is it? He said, now we must develop a program that will drive the nation to a guaranteed annual income. We must create full employment or we must create incomes. If our nation can spend billions a year to fight an unjust evil war, it can spend billions of dollars to put God's children on their own two feet. And then he powerfully concluded, because he, of course he was a, a Christian minister, and he said this, and I, I love to quote this, so I'm going to read it's not very long. One day a juror came to Jesus, and he wanted to know what he could do to be saved, and Jesus realized something basic, that if a man will lie, he will steal, and if a man will steal, he will kill. So Jesus looked at him and said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. In other words, King goes on, your whole America, your whole structure must be changed. A nation that will keep people in slavery for 244 years will exploit them and poor people generally economically. And a nation that will exploit economically will have to have foreign investments and everything else and it will have to use its military might to protect them. What I'm saying today is that we must say, America, you must be born again. And I would say that the question we want to think about today in this, uh, in this commemoration of Black History Month is if black people in America and here in Canada are in an oppressed state. We must ask the same question, where do we go from here? Thanks a lot.